the seven to one ratio uh, that's talked about across this country. It's no different here in Alabama. What we've done though in our state, uh, we have had a very laser focused uh, economic development strategy, especially since our governor, Robert Bentley, has been in office now five years. When he came in, we created what's known as Accelerate Alabama. In that plan, many, many facets of workforce development in particular included, but it was divided into three, op three uh, buckets, if you will, recruitment, retention, and renewal. And for the first time in the history of this state, we also include the universities in that model. And what that's done for us is put a whole different picture on how we're developing this workforce. And, and I know that uh, both uh, Josh here in the K-12 system and the chancellor will speak to both sides of, of the uh, uh, developing the workforce through those colleges. But as we attract business, our greatest asset is this workforce. The good news is we have a good workforce. The bad news is everybody that wants to work pretty much is. And so how we continue to bring students through those programs, get them to the level they need to have soft skills everybody talks about. It's, it's true everywhere, all over the world, not just in our country, but certainly here in the state of Alabama and the Southeast, very critical to the jobs. The technology that's out there today, just think about that phone in your pocket how quickly and rapidly all that changes. Well, in a fast-paced, advanced manufacturing operation, it's changing faster than that. Having grown up in companies like Nissan and uh, James King and I from Tennessee over here, a great friend of mine, we, we grew up with the Nissan project and Saturn and learned a lot about how to do the work we do. In the state of Alabama, we've had several uh, car plants in our state now. We have three. We're the third largest automaker in the country. Down here on the Gulf Coast, though, we for eight years courted, almost got in the boat, lost the fish a couple of times, and I'm talking about Airbus. When Airbus came to us as a project, it was a tanker. They were going to refuel uh, fighter jets in the air and make those here on the Gulf Coast in Mobile, Alabama. We won that project and then promptly lost it. And we lost it because of a uh, uh, technical snafu, if you will, in Congress and a competitor who challenged some things and at the end of the day we lost that project. What happened though when we did, because of the work we had done over those several years, Airbus decided, you know what, we need a presence in the United States, so we're going to build a commercial jet there. So today, we're assembling, as a matter of fact, if you've seen the news, the first deliverable came out, uh, painted, ready to go in the last two weeks. But job one, an Airbus 320 single aisle jet, commercial jet, was just uh, completed here, not an hour away at uh, Mobile at the Airbus uh, manufacturing facility. So, you know, when you work on these things, and those of you that's been involved in economic development know that, you know, these things are not quick, typically. It's hurry up and wait, for sure, every time. It's always not enough time. But in the work that we're in today, states that can deliver a trained workforce and they don't need to wait till they get them to try and be trained. They need them trained when they get them. They're going to be the states that succeed and can, can compete with the Chinas and the Mexicos and others that we compete with today. We just hope we get them in the southeast, whatever state it is anymore. If we happen to get them in, in our state, wonderful. But more importantly, in our Accelerate plan I mentioned was the retention piece and that part is the piece that we're mostly focused on at this current time. And so uh, with that, uh, uh, Tim, you mentioned Austin. One more comment there. We do have a large, we have a coast in Alabama, as you know, and we have a large port. I think it's the third largest on the Gulf Coast. And at the port, we have several shipbuilders and ship repair operations. One of them is an Australian company called Austin. 4,600 people. Several years ago, we needed 6,000 welders down here on the coast. 
And so we came down here and with the college system's help, we put together one hell of a welding program, I can tell you. And close to that 6,000 now have been trained and, and of course with Ingalls just across the state line in Mississippi and a host of other shipbuilders and repair people along the coast, it's just a constant, constant need. And so a lot of partnering, a lot of collaborating and we're meeting the need and that's what counts at the end of the day. I think I heard uh, the HR director at Austell say for a growth and replacement, um, they need 350 trained workers a month. Uh, it's probably closer to 400, but yeah. <laughs> so there's plenty for all of us to do. Um, Josh, let me ask you, uh, representing uh, elementary sec secondary, as we go from pre-K to grade with this uh, panel. Uh, tell us about some of the major initiatives that are going on in elementary, secondary, and, and in relation to uh, career and technical education and what you're doing uh, to assess and, and, and help with career planning and, and knowledge of these high growth, high demand, high paid jobs that we all talk about. Okay. Um, well, as, as you've heard about uh, workforce development, I, I'm the kind of person that has to boil things down to just the most basics. I walk it all the way back. And so if we talk about economic development, economic development is workforce development. As you heard at Castile say, you, you, they're concerned with all three levels of workforce development. And then when you start talking about what is workforce development, it comes back to education every time. So if you, if you look at that and you're talking about doing economic development, you're talking about enhancing your education base. Um, if you don't fix the, uh, the starting product that's coming into this workforce, then we're not going to have the people that the employers need. We're not going to have the skill sets that they're telling us they want. So really the function of the Office of Workforce Development with the Department of Education is to <coughs> listen and communicate between those industry partners. Um, we go to all the regional workforce councils and, and try to hear from them what are your industry representatives, what are your clusters telling us that they need um, skilled workers to do. And, you know, sometimes when I go and, and occasionally I'll meet with an individual company or, you know, a small group of companies and, and I've got my fingers crossed when I walk in there and I say, what is it that you need them to do? And I'm hoping they'll say, I need them to um, know how to operate the VJ22 arc welding robotic machine, da, 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 da. That's great. If you'll tell me that, that's beautiful because I can teach them that, I can guarantee you. Um, what I get every time first is I need them to show up on time I need them to show up every day, I need them to pass a drug test, be able to get along with their coworkers and put down their cell phones. And we, in the K-12 system, we're trying to, we're, we're calling them employability skills because that has more meaning than soft skills. Um, these employability skills are, are foundational, of course, and it doesn't matter what industry you're going into. So that's a big part of what we're doing um, and, and driving a new focus in our career courses in the uh, secondary side, but we're starting that even earlier. Um, in the sixth grade, we've got a program that's uh, Alabama Career Planning Network. Um, it's known by the name Cooter. And um, it is in large part about interest inventories, aptitude assessments, and it's part of a mandatory course that we created um, for every high school um, student to graduate called Career Preparedness. And so through that required course, Career Preparedness, um, like I say, I keep things simple. The point of career preparedness is to expand their bubble. So when we do these interest inventories and aptitude assessments with students in that class, the first time we do them, um, if we do them in the sixth grade, we find that students are interested in the things that they have exposure to, um, which kind of makes sense. They, they're interested in becoming a healthcare worker because they know about doctors and nurses and that kind of thing, and they're interested in becoming a teacher um, or a police officer or stuff like that. Um, what they're never listing the first time is manufacturing or um, you know any of those other, sometimes they'll list IT or computer related items because they think they're really good at computers because they play a lot of video games. Um, but generally speaking, their, their bubble is small because of the things they've been exposed to. So uh, one thing that we've done is implemented the career preparedness class where we're working on employability skills, we're working on expanding their bubble, exposing them to what other career options are out there in the state. 
we're taking the feedback from the regional councils and listening and hey these are the jobs that are really available right here down the road because I don't know if it's the same in every state but in Alabama a lot of our people they're, they're gonna live close to mama I mean I'm gonna live close to mama <laughs> so um, you know that that determines that that driving radius or whatever determines the jobs that I'm considering and so we want them to know that there are jobs available good jobs high paying jobs that you can make real careers out of we want them to know that those are available in our state and close to them and they don't have to leave from wherever their family has been for generations so we expand their bubble we show them about these things we try to teach them about employability skills one absolutely um, amazing thing we've been able to get done in the last couple of years and it's still growing is called career coaches um, so we have everybody has counselors in their schools and y'all if you if you're not familiar with the k-12 system the counselors are, are called guidance and counseling it's office of guidance and counseling and it's a ratio of about usually one to five hundred kids one counselor <laughs> five hundred kids um, how much counseling can you get done um, and not a lot so we realized that uh, guidance and counseling are, are not exactly the same thing. There, I have one person in my school, my counselor, who is trained to deal with the mental health issues, trained to identify you know, real issues that these students are having emotionally and that kind of stuff and work with them on that. That's not me. When they came in my office crying, I could not tote them to the counselor fast enough. There's, there is no crying in career tech. Um, so, but, but guidance, <laughs> You just got the reference. Um, there, but guidance is everybody's job. So the problem then is when something is everybody's job, nobody does it. Um, guidance can be done by anybody if they're well informed and if they have the time to do it. So we are working to um, enhance the training of our teachers about careers, uh, make sure that our teachers are able to speak well to students and uh, about real opportunities out there in the world, the, the one to seven problem about students going off and using uh, college and, and university as a career exploratory activity and coming out with $100,000 in student debt and a degree in art history um, and then living with mama, they get that part right, um, they, they go back home. Um, but we were able to get uh, career coaches um, funded through the legislature and a career coach is like a counselor who doesn't have all of those other responsibilities for testing and for mental health and for all the other scheduling, all that other stuff. A career coach is kind of a protected class of, of employee. Their sole job is to expand that student's bubble. So they go into the career preparedness classes, they schedule college visits, they schedule industry trips, they bring in speakers from uh, communities um, around that, hey, I have jobs over here that you might be related in, uh, interested in. They, they really bring in those outside resources that that teacher would not have necessarily even known about. Um, because for teachers, it, it sometimes falls back on us, the reason that everybody thinks they have to go to a four-year university. When you say college, they think four-year university. And so you can walk in and ask a group of seniors, what are you gonna do after you graduate? I, I'll even be more specific. My youngest niece, oldest, oldest on my wife's side, turned 18. I said, what are you gonna do after you graduate? And she named this college in Tennessee. And I said, right but what are you going to study and she went on to tell me about how perfect this college was and it is sufficiently far away from the house um, it's appropriately cute um, it's nestled in the mountains and this that and the other but what are you going to study oh i have no idea and and we're at her birthday dinner and i said are you stupid and my wife punches me because you can't call the baby stupid um, <laughs> but i said I, what do you mean you have no idea you didn't even know what they offer and and so i failed on the home front um, with that and i immediately took her into my office and made her sit down and do a cooter interest inventory and <laughs> aptitude assessment she's like really uncle josh we're gonna do this on my birthday yup you're gonna sit down and do this on your birthday so the career coaches are there to expand that bubble, to make kids aware of opportunities they didn't know about. And then we're also able to do now with our uh, dual enrollment, those of you from Alabama are familiar with this, but we have $10.3 million allocated by our legislature to fund career technical dual enrollment in the state. I don't know if anybody else has that um, across the country, but um, if you don't, it, it's, it's awesome. Um, so what we're able to do is we we're able to listen to the workforce people. They helped us establish a list of priority training jobs, priority um, you know, pathways. And if a student wants to go and take a dual enrollment technical course while they're in high school, 
It's free. It's paid for. Simple as that. They apply, they meet the applications um, requirements to get into the community college, and they go and start taking that. Now, that's great and wonderful, but we've got to make sure we're putting the right kids into the right classes. So um, I don't know if you, you remember being in high school, but uh, fellas, you may have signed up for a class or two because there was a pretty girl taking that class. Um, I joined the track team because coach sent a couple of twins to ask me if I wanted to run. <laughs> yeah, I'm <not> sure. <laughs> I look like a runner, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, they're not always making the best decisions. So we've got to really work hard on that counseling and guidance part, <laughs> excuse me, to make sure that um, they're going into fields that they are actually interested in. Well, they can't know if they're interested in it unless we've exposed them to it. So it all is kind of a, is a loop. If we don't get the right kid in the right class at the right time, to steal Gene Dudley's quote, um, right kid in the right class at the right time, then we're just, we're spinning our wheels. Um, we're not going to establish the, the trained workforce that we need for workforce development so that we can have good economic development. Um, and I can go on for, for days about this stuff. Uh, I'll get to preaching on you, so. Okay, thanks. Um, Chancellor, of course, it's your turn now. We don't have anything going on in the community college system these days, but uh, speak to all the changes that are occurring and, and uh, your vision and uh, the new board's vision for our community college system and its relationship to workforce and economic development, uh, if you would, please. Great. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. And I know in, in a lot of ways we're probably up here preaching to the choir. Uh, I, I see so many head shaking as... Uh, as you hear these speakers, I think we all struggle with a lot of the, uh, a lot of the same issues. Uh, but uh, but we, we have experienced a lot of change in the community college system, and uh, in fact, we're in the middle of change right now in an effort to address many of the, uh, many of the struggles that, uh, that you've heard mentioned here and you've heard mentioned during the course of the, uh, the conference. Uh, something Ed referenced just a moment ago, and, and, and I want to emphasize the fact that one of the reasons we've been able to make as much progress in as short a time is, uh, is support from our governor, Governor Bentley. Uh, you, you all know you have to have a supportive governor if you're going to get anything done. You'll hear from him tomorrow morning, <clears throat> and he's coming to this conference because what all of we do is extremely important to him, uh, but that has been, um, uh, that, that has been a key. Uh, and, and this is going to sound a little bit like a, a Whitman sampler of what's going on in the, in, uh, in the two-year system, uh, but I certainly will be glad to answer questions uh, later. Let me give you a snapshot of, uh, of, of who we are. We're made up of 26 uh, uh, community colleges uh, spread throughout the state. We have 86 instructional sites. We have just shy of 11,000 employees. Uh, and, and depending on how you count and when we count, uh, we have somewhere between 200 and 250,000 students, credit and non-credit uh, uh, students. So that gives you kind of a snapshot back when Governor Wallace was uh, setting up the system. Uh, certainly there was a lot of politics, but when, one of the agendas was to have an instructional site near every citizen so they could take advantage of post-secondary education. And I think uh, he, uh, he, he certainly accomplished, uh, accomplished that. Uh, last, uh, uh, last year, really last year at this time, the legislature was contemplating a separate board for the community college system, something that had been discussed repeatedly. Uh, in fact, uh, I was told that that discussion date ba dated back to the 70s. Uh, well, during last session, it occurred. Uh, and in fact, we, we had previously uh, been under an elected state board of education that served both K-12 and the two-year system. Uh, we now have our separate Alabama community college system. And, and as you might expect, there was uh, a, a lot of gnashing of teeth through all of that because people had different ideas about why this, this, uh, this all, was, uh, all was occurring. But the fact of the matter is K-12 and the two-year system are very large entities. Uh, we serve uh, large numbers of individuals, and I think the legislature, rightly so, believe that a separate board made, uh, made sense. So since May of last year, when our board was sworn in and seated, we've met uh, monthly. And uh, I, I, in, in my opinion, it's going very, very well. There's certainly a learning curve for a new board, but uh, I, I just couldn't be happier with, uh, with the direction things are going. Uh, you've also heard the reference, and again, I'm gonna state the obvious, uh, uh, the, the, the 127, the fact that for every 10 jobs uh, out there, and certainly it's true in Alabama, and I think throughout most of the country, seven are gonna require what we, what, uh, what we provide. Uh, either an associate's degree, a certificate, a certification, something. 
uh, and, and the, the funding in our state and probably the funding in your state has sort of been flipped. Uh, the emphasis has not necessarily been placed on those institutions that produce the seven. Rather, they've been focused on those institutions that prov uh, provide the one and the two. And we're gradually beginning to see a shift in, in, in Alabama because obviously you, you have to be funded if, in fact, uh, you're going to be able to pull off what, what business and industry and, uh, uh, and, and certainly others are, are demanding. Uh, the the two-year system, our mission very simply is, is threefold. Uh, we, uh, we, we have a two-year transfer program that's, uh, that's very robust. We have a, a workforce development component and we have an adult education component. And I'm not going to say a whole lot more about that, but uh, those are the, really the three pillars of what, uh, of what we do. And, uh, and we strongly believe that all three of those must work together if, in fact, we're going to produce a workforce necessary to, uh, uh, to serve the, the needs of business and industry. Uh, Ed referenced those middle skills jobs. Uh, our percentages are probably like your percentages. Our, uh, our workforce pool is made up of about 60% about is made up of middle skills workers. Uh, probably shouldn't say this out loud, but I will. We're probably fulfilling about 47 or 48% of that need. Uh, and so there is a lot of switching and trading of, of workers and, and uh, uh, all of the initiatives that we're putting forth are an attempt to, uh, to break into that and, and increase capacity and increase uh, the numbers of, uh, of, of middle, skills, uh, middle skills workers. Uh, you, you, you've heard several uh, initiatives that, that we all share and, and, and in fact, uh, the, the various agencies responsible for workforce and education, we actually get along pretty well, and we work pretty well together. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, one of the things that I know Ed and I talk about, and Tommy, uh, Tommy Bice, before he retired, talk about is that when we came into our positions, we didn't realize we were supposed to hate each other. And so we just decided to get along and work together, and it's amazing how well that works. And, and that's sort of funny to say, but it, you, you all know in your state, you, you've got this weird infighting, and it, it, it tends not to be terribly productive. But I, I do feel like we work well together, and that's, uh, that's critically important. But some, uh, some, some initiatives that we're proud of, proud of and I think are beginning to, uh, to move the needle. Uh, you, you mentioned, uh, you, you heard from Josh, uh, dual enrollment, career tech dual enrollment. To me, that's a game changer for our state. Uh, it started a couple of years ago when the legislature provided $5 million, or a little over $5 million, uh, for career tech dual enrollment. Uh, and in the middle of the next legislative session, and most of you will, will, will understand this, I get a call from a group of legislators and they wanted to come over to my office and talk to me. Well, first of all, legislators never come to your office. They summons you to their office. Mm -hmm. So you know it's bad. You know something <laughs> is not good. So I'm sitting there wondering what on earth is going to happen. Well, they come in and they sit down and they said, would you mind if we doubled your career tech dual enrollment dollars? Well, after I got up off the ground saying, you've got to be kidding me, uh, they just said, look, it is, it, it is playing very, very well in business and industry and, and out in public. It's making a difference. We're beginning to see uh, the capacity issue move in the right direction. Uh, we, we would really like to, to double it. And in fact, that happened uh, last year. This past fall, we had 10,000 of our high school students uh, duly enrolled in career tech areas. And if the budget holds for the next year, we will have that 10.2, 10.3 million dollars for this coming year as well. So I, we feel very, very blessed to um, uh, to, to to have that uh, as a part of our uh, our workforce uh, our workforce plan. Uh, I want to mention prison ed for just a moment because it is important to me. Uh, we, we are working mightily on it. We're not funded at a level we need to be funded, but prison ed falls under the community college system.